Good afternoon and most welcome to 899. Ooh, getting very close to the last lecture of the 900. Oh, what an interesting moment. I really hope that we are all present in the moment of the 900. So we're not suffering from absence. The penultimate lecture will be about Derrida's strategy of critical decentering, and I call the lecture How to Defer and How Not to Be Identical with Oneself. And this is in inspiration of the great book. Could you just borrow me for a second? You don't have to put it in here. Of Rudolf Gachea. And G.W. McInnes has written a brilliant book that holds more for students of philosophy or literature that remove the fingers that, mm, than any other single work on Derrida. It's all praise, and I never seen any praise like this, not, not even for Plotnitsky or uh, uh, Spivak, <clears throat> uh, James Snyder. It is just absolutely brilliant, and without that one, I would never be able to go this far in deconstruction. It is the being that we're looking for, and the presence of being, and this is the knowledge, that's the most important knowledge, it's the episteme of the Western culture more important than anything else. Maybe we can elevate it just a little bit as far as we can. Uh, and it is self-identity that starts the long process of how things differ from themselves. And I've been thinking about this animally, that every time you look at something, it's a little bit deferred. It's a little bit away. It's a little bit not the same. So every look will move the object because in the movement of the eye there is also a movement in location. Your eye is not the same. So if you try to focus on something, the next thing you focus on will actually literally be a little bit deferred. Um, even though it doesn't make that much difference on the level of the eye. If you take that three or four meters, it would be a deference. So things are not stable in the world. Another thing that I think is quite interesting is that our visual area is not much uh, than half a matchbox. This is the clear area of our vision. The rest is, so to speak, made up. This made up stuff is actually the dark matter of neurology. Some says it is the brain that makes up the rest based on what is potentially there or what is probably there. But what we do know, modern man has great difficulty in discerning objects that disappear from his or her surrounding. So we don't seem to have the same awareness of our surroundings that we used to have because the difference one has been doing these sort of games uh, leaving people in the room and taking them out again and you take away something possibly a chair or something similar today the observance of rather large objects even to the size of a minor car do get unnoticed by somewhere in the vicinity of 65-66%. That's another combination. So our eyes are constantly deferring. Defer has two interesting meanings in English. One meaning is the sheer difference in location. In location. But differ is also a differ in time. So it has both tendency. There is 
uh, temporal side to the world differ? And this is so interesting because I can defer from this meeting. That means I'm not present. I was deferred by five minutes. The construct of difference from uh, Derrida is constructed of the combination, making up a new word, which is spelled the same, spell, spell different, but it is pronounced the same way in French. This is how he helps us to understand what is differing, what is difference. So there is a difference in spacing and it's a difference in temporalization. And the reason for difference is to prevent conceptual closure. And we, we just went through this with another name. But I think this is a very nice name, conceptual closure. And one could say that it means that something is in a certain space at a certain time, also to be compared with the origo. If you add the time line, you get a definite place on that one and also the object in a certain timeline. This is not an exaggeration to say that Derrida shows this to be an impossibility in every case, and but he's mainly working with text, literary texts, uh, but he also enters philosophy. Plato's Pharmacy was my first read, or second read, I think it was. I really liked it, but he's also handling analytical philosophers like John Searle, uh, where he shows that he's different to what himself is saying. So what Derrida is looking into are different varieties of centrism. Things that are pre-ontological, pre-conceptual, and pre-thinking even. And therefore, these tendencies has a very great influence. If they were words, concepts, hypotheses, it would be very easy to say yes or no, or what is it? But with something that is pre-ontological, no questions could be asked, because every question will actually miss the target. So it cannot be understood in a regular way. And I would say, from my own take, this is a partial understanding. Ethnocentrism, anthropocentrism, phallocentrism, egocentrism, theocentrism, and logocentrism. Uh, he commences his deconstruction of the Western metaphysics of present with an effort to critically Decenter what he calls the ontotheological discourse. And in Western metaphysics of presence, God has been comprehended as absolute being. Presence of identity. In other words, God is the absolute center. In this context, Derrida speaks of negative theology which endeavors to deconstruct the transcendent god of theocentrism, thought of as the transcendental signified. He writes, just as there is a negative theology, there is a negative atheology. An accomplice of the former is still, pronounce, still pronounces the absence of a center. So it's interesting, he turns the table on atheism and he says it's also a sort of centrism, although in a negative sense. That does, according to Derrida, not mean that you have escaped centrism. You just put it with a different name. And this renaming principle is incredibly prevalent. And I would say the renaming principle 
is one of the markers of modern age. Rene Newman. I want to spell it in pink at the same time. If one should call this looking. The Swedish is gone on for a while. We were name things instead of doing things. So you call uh, your uh, pastime, your free time. Yes, local border is one good instance. It changed name five times until somebody stopped the process. It started with cleaning lady and then it became something just appalling. Hygiene technique. Hygiene te technician. And then it became, I think what it ended with is local border. And this renaming principle is also very prevalent in academics. Big investigation in the late 90s showed that 95% of all knowledge in academia is a renaming of things that the students already know when he enters the university. I did notice that because most of linguistics was renaming. And actually my late teacher uh, well, I, I shouldn't say late, ex-teacher, sorry, she's not gone. Elisabeth Alseum said, that is the good thing. She praised that, and I think most teachers do that, that we don't enter into an external reality. And once you leave these doors, she said, you will know exactly the same thing you know now, but you're going to put different words to them. This can effectively also be done by a machine that Christian Herman did. I don't know if I told you about this. I had a friend who was a computer whiz called Herman. He made a program that could actually develop small essays, B level, that's the second level in Sweden, and they get uh, a G, that means that it was okay. In academia. In academia, yeah. Uh, he tried in social linguistics and also tried in anthropology, social anthropology. I, I really like these names also, social anthropology. What would that mean? I don't even know what he means. He said, it sounds mysterious. And this is what the renaming underlie everything. And of course, this creates anger within, within the person. Uh, I saw, uh, remember one meeting with a professor of linguistics, Jens Olbert. He was very influential then, the institution were at its height because in that age people still thought that we could use human language to construct AI and also that the best place to develop programs that understood human language that we have today, 2022, would go through linguistics and then he got billions of money into his institution which he used both for something called computer linguistics and also into his own institutions. I don't know how many teachers were hired, but that became big and he was a very pompous man. He still is. So he took over authority of Swedish and science and literature and he had a big influence. And he used to, in the conferences, when somebody raced, he laughed prematurely before they opened their mouths. To show really how wrong they were. To cite our friend whose name I won't mention, we who know, he knowed in advance. And this is something Elizabeth often said. I know this in advance. I don't have to study a language. I know in advance what it is about. There's no need for any word. Word. Well, the both. Word and word. Another thing tried out by a Japanese fellow called Karatani Kojin. He says that there is time to deconstruct both modernism and postmodernism because this is another name change. It's a whole series of wordings that uh, tries to construct an illusion of presence by renaming and even by acquiring the traits of absence, pretending to be absence. A postmodernist says every truth is relative, everywhere. Listen to this. 
every truth is relative everywhere. Every truth is relative everywhere. I think this Karatani has a point. I never thought it was any reason to think that postmodernism was like embracing absence. It's just the opposite. This is a centrist word. Everything, every truth is relative everywhere. All of a sudden you have the absolute, but it, with the renaming principle, it sort of hides itself. It actually looks like very modern. Yeah, I, do, I think every truth everywhere that everyone ever said is completely relative. There's no absolute truth. And this is an absolute truth that there is no absolute truth. Who falls for this trick? Well, I did, <laughs> to be honest. I felt it for it a lot. And actually, to be quite honest, even more honest, I thought that was, was actually the point of Derrida in the beginning. Maybe only the six first months. It sounds like that, that also everyone becomes equal. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In this sense, every every... Everyone is equal. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Rasa. All, all, all truths are value the same. And therefore, uh, to uh, parallel uh, what Henrik said with what Ian McKilchrist said, something happening uh, in the 17th century when they said, well, let's take out the holy out of the churches. Let's take out the icons, everything holy. Let's make them bare. So everything becomes holy. And by making everything holy, nothing is holy, because there's no difference anymore. So making the claim, everything or everywhere is oddly enough just the opposite in some ways. It embraces the oppositions, and that lies in the very nature of these things. But it sounds better and you can dress differently, you can be postmodernist and smoke cigarettes without filters. That's maybe the trick. Even put out one of those French berets. I think we should look out carefully about postmodernism and I also think that Jordan Peterson got it completely wrong. It's not a threat, it's just the old centrism renamed. There's no difference at all. Until we let absence and presence be a part of reality, we will have these problems. And there's no absolute. It's also, isn't it very simple to just to turn the table? It's, it's sort of what you say, I say no to automatically. And thereby I construct in my own theory. It's very easy. It doesn't take much thinking. And uh, saying no, it's, it's a bit like my friend in Facebook or whatever it was, saying no to everything and making up the truth as he goes. I think there is more to reality than just negation and contradiction. It's not, it's not part of the world. This is not what Derrida is saying either. Get rid of all the contradictions. Not, not the point at all. It's very far from. It's, <laughs> It's, it's <laughs> no, I think he has a point, this Karatani Kojin. Uh, never heard about him before. But all centers are problematic in a sense. You need to understand them. And by understanding them, we do this thing called decentering. And decentering is also, when I talk about that, when I talk about decentering here on the paper, I feel dissented myself, I feel more balanced, because there is a certain, to centering, it's a certain thing, like this, bending out of balance.
So this text also takes some help from Magliola. I think it should be mentioned now at the very end of this century. According to Magliola, the difference of Derrida, like the Shunyata of Nagarjuna, represents a critical deconstruction of the principle of self-identity. What in Buddhist discourse takes the form of disconstituting all substantialist modes of own being or self-existing, svabhava. Though the constructionist analysis all metaphysical centers understood as a mode of absolute self-identity are disseminated into a network of differential relationships in which there are no positive entities. This is not actually completely correct. And uh, Magliola doesn't take the last step. And this is actually being recorded by witnesses. Uh, talking to Nagarjuna, he says the Chaturskoti, which you mentioned before, that has four corners. Four corners. Uh, not is is and uh, both and neither this is the logical fold from neither this is the logical fold from and or and strong and you can call it too he says there is actually a fifth solution none of these so not self-identity, it's that's not correct either, obviously. And I understood that from Gache. The criticism is not according to self-identity. You go beyond that. You go beyond that. But isn't that the fourth corner? Neither. Yeah, none of these is neither. Yeah, yeah. yeah neither. What's the difference between not, uh, sorry, neither? None of these positions. So isn't that what the first four says? Last corner says. No, no, it's it, it doesn't say anything about the all four corners. Uh, the fifth principle is none of this or all of this. It's a specific word that is called I don't have it here before. Kuja. And it doesn't mean not, and it doesn't mean uh, exist. No, neither. No, it's not that either. Mm -hmm. So there's a fifth principle. And I think therein lies the point. Everything, and one way of explaining this, everything returns to normal. So all of a sudden you have self-identity and you have contradictions. That's one way of explaining it. So you, you go to a place before you even do the chatuscotti. And everything is like it is. I, I really like that, but I don't pretend to understand it. It sounds like a, like a mirror thing, a reflective yeah, mirror. Yeah, it, it, I, I, I can tell you honest, mirror I have a sense of it, thanks to this mm -hmm. book. And he, as he says, this is something you work in for years. So I'm getting a sense of this, only vaguely. This is a late afternoon lecture, six o'clock, we should have been in siesta. But by starting this, we are building the foundation. The only way of not understanding is that you take the whole truth at once. That is the only blockage to truth. And that said, my teacher actually, he's, he's, he's late, he doesn't exist anymore. But I think that was the most important point for me. If you get the whole truth at once, you won't understand. And then you will say, I understand, and then you block further development. And this is what we done. This is Heidegger's point about only one thing, the ontic. That is something we've been guilty of before. So it's not unlikely that we are doing it on a regular basis. It's too grand to understand. We don't get it partially. And then we say, or believe us to have understood everything, we need to start over. And uh, that was also uh, the battle cry of Edvard de Bono. When you start reading my books, admit that you're not rational, because you don't know rationality. I, I completely agree. Most of my decisions I made my life have been 
like happenstance, random. And that's a very important lesson to understand. Because if you don't understand, there's no learning. If you put yourself on high horses direct, you, you're already, already up there. And that is the most painful thing you can ever decide on, because that leaves you out of knowledge. That's of course what academia does. It gives you title, gives you all this renaming stuff. And uh, I think one of those girls, uh, I spoke about that for the first couple of weeks at university. And uh, we were sitting in the coffee shop for the university and I was having a bun or something. And there was these two girls. And uh, she said, one said to the other, do you want me to buy you some coffee and bread? It's called fika in Swedish. And the other one said, no, you are at the in university now. You should say, I hereby invite you to the consummation of carbohydrate-based food. She knew it was about, and I was so disappointed, and I said, they're probably not. It was exactly how it was. Every moment in university was like that. It was a renaming, and they admitted it. And there was such a huge disappointment because I went there to learn. I got nothing of it. And they said it to you, like putting it in your face. And of course, I still lingered on. I thought, it can't be possible to build all this high building and paying for these teachers and there is nothing underneath. There weren't anything underneath. And they admitted it. That was a tough thing. And actually a friend of mine, he was sent into... Uh, routes into the mental institution by that because that, that happens in the end yeah he was so shocked by it and he confused his head with all these renaming one instant it was called context and the other course it was called discourse and he thought it was different things somehow and you start talking about different things and there is no reality you get so confused you can actually end up being sick really and i say this to doc a lot of my teachers was also really angry. This anger comes from this lack of understanding, lack of knowledge. I had one teacher in philosophy, Eva Mark, he was, she was screaming every other lecture. Of course, that lack of knowledge, and you only get uh, like eating plastic food. Uh, <laughs> Magliola calls this the new academia what was invented in the late 18th century. Almost at the same time we said, we only need a, a fourth or the fifth decimal and then we're ready. And this is the idea, all knowledge is already had. You can only rename. And you, you need to constantly rename knowledge to make it appear as new. No wonder we need deconstruction. I don't know where we would be without it. I, I, I say this about if I would be sane without deconstruction, having all the, this, uh, uh, but they're not even Pharisees, they're all a joke of Pharisees in a way. There is also a negation of the difference, it's very interesting. It signals the re-emergence of a non-substantial trace which is simultaneously absent yet present, present yet absent. In this context, Magliola argues that differences as the interplay of identity and difference or presence and absence is equivalent to Nagarjuna's idea of sunyata or shunyata. And he puts it in writing this way. Like non-existence, shunyata is emptiness, and that is empty of any concept. Mm. It is rather brilliant. The fifth. The fifth, yeah, yeah, the fifth, yeah. So the funny thing is, we can talk about that, but we cannot understand it. Isn't that fantastic what language can do? And I think this show an opening that is more than just mere words. And this is a point of Magliola. And when I read this by Magliola, I think he would be the third uh, to be praised in this uh, level uh, 
Rodolphe Gachet be number one, and then comes Susie Frobo. Uh, Magliola takes a good third. There is a reason for the renaming, and that is somehow because these people, including me, we don't have access to the fifth way or uh, the shutting out of Shunyata, and therefore we cannot have existence either. We need to accept absence to have existence. And that, that's in, very interesting because when you embrace it, as this could be shown graphically, that's why I should be drawing more, but if you have this, you say have this figure, and you say this is the important thing, isn't it obvious if you take this part as well and you put a plus here and you get both, you get more. And that will do both for time, space and knowledge. And how often don't we negate something and then we take away some of our own knowledge somehow? It is difficult. And this is what the, these people are doing, the renaming. It's not something bad, the renaming. It's a sign of a complete lack. They are stuck in this spiraling down. And for every time they rename, it gets more and more frustrated, hysterical or desperate. Because I get a feeling of desperation. I really felt sorry for some of these people. Because I realized they weren't bad people. At least some of them weren't still bad. But they were frustrated. And you could hear the desperation in them. And giving up the quest for presence and absence. That's not the solution either. Not at all. Because we need existence. We need presence. The fifth way is very important, and that's the point of Magliola. And that is going to heal us. And that takes a whole other level of understanding, where we are willing to accept something before we understand it. And this is one of the reasons this is so important. And remember, I, this, I, I, I really like this because uh, I just stumbled a part of this article, and he did it just like this. Mm -hmm. Crossing off of Shunyata. And this is what Martin Heidegger did in the margins of his later books. And he did still not understand it literally in his head. But he did it. He made it. And I think that is, sorry for Martin Heidegger in a way, but he got halfway. We start by saying it and then showing it. And then later comes the understanding. And we had, just with this thing, we had to do it in another order. That's the only way. We cannot get to the fifth directly, because we are going to bounce our head against something that cannot be conquered that way. But it can be conquered indirectly by crossing it out. That's how Martin Heidegger did it. And that helped actually Malot Ponty. And who's crossing out to? Jacques Derrida. So a lot of his understanding actually came from things that Heidegger partly understood. And this is also what Graham Priest says. He says, Heidegger needed para consistent logic. That was his term. It's called die Kere. He knew he was turning somewhere himself. Starting uh, late 30s and the beginning of the 40s already. And he was almost there. So uh, I think this is a very good sign. It's incredibly interesting. And I don't think there is a happenstance which will happen in quantum mechanics. Good. Even though Heidegger wasn't directly interested in those things, it was in the air. And if you stop feeling that the body ends here and that your knowledge is in your head, it stretches out somehow, it expands. So it is an understanding on, of what I would call non-localized knowledge. Because just by restricting what you know to what you own, what you have in your storage, you are already doing this thing, taking away the plus and say, this is what I know. The other is unknown.
put those together and you get twice thrice as much so there is a lot of interesting truth to this shunyata and uh, of course he was kidnapped by uh, and this is a big problem he was kidnapped by schopenhauer he was kidnapped all does schopenhauer know about shunyata and he thought he was giving up of everything and being depressed and negative yeah he did actually not i was lying here the emptiness it was fucking horrible so he still had this centeredness in presence and he said this is he, you could say he was not a uh, he said the solution to the quest for presence is to give up the quest for presence and give up everything it's a sort of uh, yeah terrible thing to say but he didn't have the fifth either of course he was before heidegger if heidegger would have known because he knew everything about philosophy that was to know bar nothing he would have known that thing schopenhauer didn't know it and then he became a tradition actually in the western world to see uh, everything coming from the east as some sort of nihilism nietzsche thought that as well it didn't have any value it was the absolute denial of every value and i think that is a grand mistake understandable mistake because nothing came before martin heidegger he didn't have the understanding he know everything about western philosophy but i think this is just absolutely fantastic beginning to understand that there is a fifth way absolutely interesting and uh, I think 30 minutes is done there and I say thank you very much. It was an introduction to Magliola. I already mentioned Rodolf Gachet and then we would dwell into Susie Froebel to sort of knit the whole thing off. But that will be after the grand dinner that we will enjoy here in Gothenburg. in Gothenburg in the delicious island of Hisinga now when we have the fifth thing we don't even need to understand it it can start anyway we do the same thing as Heidegger and maybe in a half an hour two hours or 50 years we will understand but this is the first step to understanding in a different way it is similar to what could have happened to me i could have accepted i could take it tight and say i know all these things I, I i can say i i i hereby propose an invitation to the consummation of carbohydrate food and it would be a chargeability of 0 0.00 corons which is equivalent to this in dollar and that in pounds and hereby i admittedly say i um, did enjoy the pre pre preprandial food preprandial food that means before dinner or before evening bath that's another fancy word uh, well i say thank you very much and i wish you all a very pleasant afternoon bye bye